Hey, Joanna. Hi, Ida. How are you today? I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, and we are joined by a growing list of uh, colleagues uh, and it's watching the numbers jump up. But I think we'll go ahead and jump in for the day. Can you hear me okay? Started. Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Can you hear me from my glorious home office in Silver Spring, Maryland? Yes. Yes, I can. And I like, I like the backdrop. Uh, mine is more of a, a makeshift uh, shed that was in the back backyard that I've repurposed down here in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, complete with um, a deer head that came with the property. And um, if anybody has good names for them, I'm, I'm open to them. Uh, but yeah. hi, everybody joining us. Uh, I'm Ida Rademacher. I'm the uh, Executive Director of the Financial Security Program at the Aspen Institute. Joanna? Hi, everyone. I'm Joanna smith Romani, the Managing Director of the Financial Security Program at the Aspen Institute. And just really excited to be here with you guys as we kick off our series. Yeah, so, uh, so I just want to do a little bit of uh, table setting for us as we get started today. Uh, Joanna and I are here from our virtual offices to kick off a 10-part series on financial security in a COVID-19 world uh, that is a, a labor of love from uh, all of the members of the financial security program team here at the Aspen Institute. It, uh, we landed on the idea for it uh, out of a whole bunch of conversations uh, with probably a lot of you on this call. Thank you for your time uh, the last several weeks from a lot of internal conversations uh, and, and, and a sense of why we exist at the Aspen Institute and what's the best contribution we can make uh, at this moment um, uh, for our field and for the financial security of households uh, in the United States. So, so really, we're just going to be able to do some, some framing up of this series that's going to be starting um, two weeks from today on the 29th and, and give a bit of a taste of the uh, the topics that we'll be covering in depth and um, and the ways that we are starting to think about the, the way that we start to approach issues now uh, to make sure that people are equipped with um, the best information, the best knowledge, the best networks uh, to take action. Uh, so for those of you who, who are first time uh, meeting Joanna and I, it's great to meet you, yeah, even in this way. And for those of you we know, it's, it's great to see you in this virtual room today. Um, uh, at the Aspen Institute, for those who are are unfamiliar, it, it's an institution that was founded in 1949 in, in the wake of World War II. Um, at the same time that a lot of other institutions were starting after uh, a huge series of world changes that really made us question and rethink the role of institutions in society and building a good and strong and 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 an inclusive society. Aspen has continued that mission, uh, supporting leaders, um, driving change on critical issues of the day. And, and the financial security program itself really has been focused on, you know, when Joanna came and joined me in 2015, you know, what are the critical financial challenges facing American households? And how do we uh, not just understand those issues, but uh, help other people prioritize the solving of those challenges because the household level financial security, as we're seeing right now in this world, really does uh, ladder on up to the ability of an entire economy to perform and be resilient um, and, and, um, and create uh, the opportunity for prosperity and well-being um, for everyone. Um, we, we started the program because making financial security a priority, even in the best of times, was was hard. Uh, it needed to be something that people understood uh, and had some empathy for. And even in the best of times, which you could argue was really only a couple of months ago, by some macroeconomic indicators, uh, that was problematic. And here we are today, and uh, it's you don't we don't we are not having to make the case that financial security is um, both uh, under severe threat at the household level, but also that it's a priority to address it. Uh, to stave off long-term economic hits, but also political ones, um, and uh, what's going on with our democracy today. So, so that's where we're starting. Um, uh, Joanna, I wonder if you might say something too about about why we started this now, and and kind of like where households are. Uh, yeah. Even the COVID world started. Well, so I'll just say Ida outlined, as always, the the ambitious place we start, but because we know we can make progress. 
And um, I am excited for the series and for us kicking it off, getting both into the macro what's happening and the micro how our household's faring, because I think Ida's right. There's no sort of trying to make the case for why this matters, but there still is a sense of what is the leadership I bring to making it matter. So in the time of COVID, not all of us are healthcare professionals like my best friend and her husband. Many of us can't sew like myself, so I can't make masks, but my superpower is around policy and around translation and around hopefully bringing the best set of ideas and actions to folks like you listening in with us, all already over 200 people listening, um, so that you know what you can do. I believe you joined this call because you are looking for what you can do. You, like us, are waking up every day saying, okay, it's day whatever of quarantine, families are suffering. It is the work of this country to rebuild those families, but what is my piece? Because I can't do it all, but certainly I have a role. So I am, I'm just thrilled that we are kicking this off, that in a little bit in this conversation, we're gonna preview all the topics and give our own um, like sneak peek at what we think will be most exciting about it. And then you can decide which all of them, which three of them, which five of them you need to attend because you're someone who can do something about those pieces. So just have it in the back of your mind, uh, listeners, as we go through this. But. And, and there may yeah. be an unsolicited opinion or two from Joanna, but that would be highly unusual, I think. Very unusual. I do have a series of podcasts that I'm planning in my mind. I won't give you all of their names, but one is Unsolicited Ideas by Joanna and Ida, a weekly podcast about financial security. So stay tuned for that. That'll be coming later after we finish our series. Um, so let, let's like get to the meat of this, Ida. We had talked about like, do we have to frame up what financial security is? Should we talk about it? pre and post COVID, it's, it's all happening now. So let's just like get into why we are in this business. Like you said, it is tr it, it was not great in December. Um, it was maybe more invisible than it should have been, the struggles families were facing. Now it is very visible, much more universally spread around the country. The heart of what the problems are aren't actually different, just worse. And that, that leads to different kinds of solution ideas or different ways of scaling ideas that we think work. Um, but what for you, like, do you have one or two things on the top of your mind that you were saying are like, this is the heart of the matter for families, household financial security? Yeah, I, I mean, I think part of why we thought we had something uh, helpful to bring in is that Aspen is, um, FSP, we're not gonna be the lead new research breaking research every day what we what we do well and what i think what struck both of us when we when we really came to aspen was there is an incredible uh, group of researchers in the public and private sector there's a group of practitioners uh there's a group of financial service providers they all are having incredible insights there's a lot of information but there was a, a lack of a place where there was real synthesis and um uh translation about this unique bundle of information into actionable um, and, and frameworks and solutions. So when we started to do that, we started to peel the onion of financial insecurity. And partly with the, the EPIC program, uh, partly with the, the broader consumer insights work that we've been doing, we've been looking uh, sequentially at a whole series of those issues that we think are at the heart of what was driving uh, high levels of stress and insecurity pre-COVID and which are just now um, just magnified. Yeah. So, you know, the, the layering of that were, you know, things that people know about and we certainly spelled out in some of the early work we did with the Asset Funders Network was, um, you know, we've known for a long time that wages, income has been relatively stagnant for households, um, for most of the households in the, in the bottom, you know, three or four income brackets, about 80% of households really have been experiencing little increase in income. Um, but in addition to that kind of stagnation, there's been um, a lot more volatility. Um, yeah. And I think one of the things that's different about volatility is that when we explored income volatility in Epic, we saw that uh, a lot of that volatility was from um, within a job. It was an un unpredictable scheduling issue. What we're seeing in the COVID world is that that income volatility is coming from that uh, that income from earnings stopping. Right. 
for Stop. just growing migrant folks, and, and, and you've got some research on that. So that was one piece. So we had wage stagnation and volatility happening at the same time. We also had um, uh, a lot of expense shocks that we know people were dealing with uh, because they had uh, little ability to uh, deal with it with their income. Um, with whatever kind of liquidity they could get their hands on, a lot of times that was debt. So we've gone very deep into consumer debt. Um, and understanding the ways that that's happening. And at the same time, we know that people have very limited savings. Uh, we, everybody's heard the $400 statistic. Um, we certainly saw, even with the furlough last year, that people making, really having consistent jobs and steady income uh, when it came to a furlough of a month were having a problem. So it, it's really no surprise that, um, I, I kind of talked about this uh, internally a little bit, and I haven't written about it yet, but you know, it's. It's just, it's mind blowing to me. We started the year, if you think back to January and what people were looking at, we were looking at the Australian forest fires. We were looking at the bushfires. So uh, long ago, yeah. In your minds. And the reality of that, and when we think about management, land management, is that, you know, the magnitude of those forest fires becomes so deadly so fast because there is a huge amount of underbrush and a lack of maintenance to the you know the, the management side that we do that that happened um combined with a whole bunch of um ex environmental factors that were beyond anybody's control but we kind of have a parallel of that going on now with covid and people's financial lives right we already were at peak debt for many households we already were dealing with a lack of savings we already had a safety net with a lot of holes in it in terms of how the unemployment system worked for folks um, uh, you add on to that, um, you know, that's this limited and precarious cash flow and, that we really learned about early on in the financial diaries and through the shed and through the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute's work and all of the people who contributed to that work. And it's it's not surprising at all that the first response had to be a two trillion dollar, you know, uh, answer of uh, I, I don't call it a stimulus. I would call it a, a stay homeless. You know, it's like this is really about um, what it takes to keep people home. Um, but we also have to think about that over the long term, about what does it take for economic dignity to um, right. be intact yeah. over yeah. time. So those were, you know, those for us were the, the big things. And I think as right. you really, uh, pointed out and, and the where we've gone with Epic in the past year was not looking so much at what's coming in and how people are spending, but the rising costs side of it. And yeah, maybe I mean, that's the other side of it, I think, when you know, the great folks at the St. Louis Fed, Ray, Bush, Ray Bushar and others have this idea of like, what is the household balance sheet, right? And there's the, the income side, but then we have the expense side, not just in shocks, but in what is just the, the foundational set of needs a household has, right? Housing prices have gone up, you know, enormously, medical, both care costs, insurance costs, kind of everything in that bracket have gone up enormously, child care or just dependent care in general, which I know, we are going to focus a whole one of these series on has gone up enormously. Um, transportation has gone up enormously. And then this other bucket that you kind of alluded to with peak debt, which is like debt servicing as part of our budget line item, right? So I have all those things plus debt servicing, which includes even medical debt, student loan debt, credit card debt. So we have this balance sheet mismatch um, already which has no gap in it. You know, we're always trying to close gaps, like the racial wealth gap, other gaps, income gaps, as we should be trying to close. And yet in this case, we want a bigger gap between what is the expenses we have and what is the income that we bring in. Like we need to widen that gap so that we actually have some cushion because families just have literally no slack, had no slack up the income ladder, as you pointed out with the furloughs going into 2020 and certainly like we're exposing all that tightness now. Um, you know, the financial, I just wanna throw out a color, couple of stats for folks so they know that we're not just like, this is what's in Ida and Joanna's head, but this is actually evidence-based. Uh, financial Health Network has done some really important survey with their pulse and 47% of Americans they polled said that their spending exceeds their income. So it's half of Americans, this is not a poverty problem. This is also, a more you know vulnerable families feel this worst problem but it's not exclusively there um and then 43 percent are using credit to make ends meet so that this is pre-covid so like imagine this world now 
where we don't have the same, like that thing that I had, I don't remember which hand was which, but essentially we want this with income and expenses. We already weren't right and now we're worse off and we're filling it with either credit, going without basic needs and other ways that we're taking away enormous economic dignity from families. It's, I mean, it's, it's like keeps you up at night, kind of mind blowing. Yeah, there, I mean, there's, there's, I do like too that the, the diversity of researchers, policy analysts that are kind of uh, starting to look at things this methodically is, is growing. Uh, I think another thing that a lot of our team really, really has valued is Oren Cass um, uh, and the work that he was doing trying to show uh, the that gap that you're talking about uh, between uh, you know the growth in um, nominal living nominal wages in the last 20 30 years and and they have grown but the whole point is grown in comparison to to what you know to and and in terms of comparison to costs they the costs have totally outstripped so when he looks at a nominal wage going up between the the 80s and the you know 2018 it, you know it did go up about 130 2% um, in Orrin Cass's research, but uh, but the cost of expenditures on housing, transportation, healthcare, education, uh, that went up 311%. Uh, so you know there is there is there is yeah. a, a lot there. I think what we're what we're doing with and we'll go into the series now talking about this is that there's a there's a way at the moment um, that the that we need to focus on obviously just what is the triage moment you know what do households need um, right. and I think that there's again we're going to come at that from two different directions we know from a lot of the research we put out a piece last year um, that again was a synthesis piece it was really thanks to the deep insights of a lot of the nonprofits in our consumer insights collaborative uh, that have uh, you know that serve about 400,000 low and moderate income households a year and have really deep insights into what happens in their financial lives and we looked at what drives short-term financial stability for those households. Right. Um, you know, number one in that finding was a predictable, consistent, positive cash flow, right? That was number one. Then people needed liquidity. They needed to rely on quick credit. And then they also said in that that the number four was really family and friends. And it was so interesting. People like in the financial yeah. services realm might say, well, what about insurance? But a lot of those households don't have access to insurance. It's not top of mind. It's something that actually could help them. So I think, again, as we go to the safety net, that would help a lot to think about that. Um, but this consistent positive cash flow is one piece. You know, what do people need in terms of keeping themselves whole in the moment for cash infusions? But then on the flip side of that, we should be asking ourselves in this triage moment, how do we, what are all the different ways we can contain costs for households? Yeah. And then we need to look longer term at and what are the ways that we can mitigate um, the, uh, the the effects of the kind of debt that's potentially accumulating if there's unpaid bills, um, if things have been deferred. So I think we'll be going through some of those strategies, but that's really our kind of a triage framework. And of course, as we go through the work, we will um, you know start to look further and further out uh, because we need to and because this will pass. We will have hope, we will have solutions and and we will be able to uh, you know, get back to a point of thinking more systemically and structurally about the kind of systems we need to make sure that we, to your point before, I mean, I guess to, come, to, to think about another metaphor we might think about, again, with fire, like one of the big solutions is to have a fire break. You know, like one of the big ways to stop an inferno is to make sure there's a buffer zone. And we don't have either with our uh, social policies or our personal savings an adequate buffer zone between when an emergency starts to crop up and what we can do to deal with that. There's a there's a reason that this there's many reasons the strategies um, for recovery look different in China than they do here. One of them is that China has a 30% savings rate. You know, the, ho the household average savings rate is 30%. The household average savings rate in the U.S. is um, uh, really, when you think about everybody, all the people who are actually in net debt, you know, it's it's less than a percentage point. Even though some higher higher income households have high savings, but when we think about the average person, very little savings, including their retirement savings. So let's uh, let's switch. Do you think? Well, actually, go yeah, ahead. I mean, I'm just going to quickly add on to that, and I think everyone now sees that our colleague Megan, who's behind the scenes managing all the technology, and thank you, Megan, for that, 
threw up our topics here uh, to get you excited. And so Ida and I can get excited ourselves about them and talk through them a little bit. But I mean, the one other thing that I was gonna mention about the, the now, like the triage versus the recovery, which is sort of what we see next as a set of work to do versus the stabilize, which is really around systems, is that this will pass, but we have been changed for it uh, in, in good and bad ways and another emergency will come up, right? Like we know that there will be different kind of weather events that will come up. Hopefully it doesn't take down an entire world, but it will. Um, and so it is really, again, I, I challenged everyone in the beginning of this call to you showed up for a reason. What is the piece of, piece of this list that you're gonna take leadership on and not just in the, what are you gonna do right now? But in the where do you sit for triage, where do you sit for recovery, and, and what's your role in the systems change, and that's in the private and public sector. Uh, the leadership is needed in both places because we we cannot go through something like this and see our country in such pain and crisis. Um, I was just reading an article in the New York Times about the three hour lines for food at the food banks and say to ourselves, well, if we just get through this moment, everything will go back to normal. That's just, that's an unacceptable uh, response to this. And I, I think everyone who's joined this call believes that and that's why they're here. So it's what are we gonna do in the long term after we make sure the pain of today is being dealt with? Um, so let's look at the, the topics, which I am super excited about. Uh, yep. What do you think about the safety net part of it? I, I know you've given this part deep thought. Yeah, and I, I think I'll make a blanket um thing too that just so we cover it joe which is i think yeah. some of the other fault lines that are happening in the moment that we'll tackle in each yeah. of these is some of the disproportionate ways that both covid 19 uh but the also the financial security the, the vulnerability in households um has a a race and gender dimension to it um Absolutely. and and quite frankly some geographic dimensions as well um which again we really do have to um, pay close attention to in yeah. the moment, in the emergency moment, in the solutions we can bring to bear, and have top of mind as we think about the infrastructure we build or rebuild yeah. for um, longer term financial security and stability yeah. purposes. That, that's like a, a, such a critical piece to this is the inequities and how families are experiencing this, households are experiencing this, and in the part of that is the systems that we already had set up that led to that, what are we going to do better? So thank you for bringing that in. We can, you know, I think we can, we can go through these with some of that in mind, but you know, the first one that we're going to tee up with in April, uh, and we've already had some uh, other kinds of conversations uh, that have related to this, uh, uh, which, but we're focusing on people, technology, and the safety net. And of course, this is actually the place right now in the moment that everybody is seeing uh, the, um, the complete uh, in effect inefficiencies um, and holes in the existing safety net. One of the yeah. places where that comes up, of course, obviously, that we've already seen, you know, one of the ways, one of the briefs we did when we did our income volatility work was looking at the unemployment insurance system and um, how much that had been uh, eroded in many states around the country. Um, again, even several years ago, when, when people in Florida, when one in nine people who became unemployed were actually eligible for unemployment insurance, you know, that was a big problem. And so we're looking at these confounding factors, unemployment insurance is one example, um, of what happens when the systems themselves are antiquated technologically, uh, yeah. when we're relying on some level of uh, paper and I think COBOL, did I hear COBOL is the um, the operating system? <laughs> um, I don't think anybody's worked with COBOL for a think No one is even alive still that knows how to fix it kind of problem with the... the so this the, is the actually started looking at um, uh, the, the tech-enabled safety net. Justin King uh, is really leading on a lot of this work uh, for, for the financial security program. Uh, but Joe, you say something really uh, important a lot of the time about the safety net. Um, you talk about uh, just who actually uses it and um and how how many misconceptions there are in america that i actually think we're all going to be seeing front up up close right now as we try to tackle this in this in this call yeah well thank you for, for i was like i say something important about it i appreciate that call out um well it's true i think you know we have these assumptions in our heads about safety net is for people not working it's like the old welfare stuff of the 80s 
you know, as it turns out, many low wage workers in this country, including people that serve in our military, actually rely on forms of the safety net because it's insurance for them. The same way you and I get adequate insurance coverage and other benefits from Aspen Institute, our employer, other employers do not give those out and instead those workers rely. They are working and relying on the government for certain benefits. Um, more people will be relying on them, both because they're not working or because they're partially working. It'll be kind of 2008 again, but exploded. And that'll put pressure on the systems. That'll give, I hope, people empathetic insights into what it's like to be inside of these systems that are very degrading and not kind of built with user-centered design in any way, shape, or form. Um, and that then don't, at the end of the day, have the policy impact we all want for households and families, right? Like at the end of the day, they're not even doing what we need them to do in part because of design and in large part because of our own wrong understanding of the use of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very excited about that. Also about that body of work that's you know expanding with us here at FSP and picking up on some of the awesome work our partners at Ascend and other folks at Aspen have been doing. So just critical stuff. I'm looking at the time, Ida, and you and I could talk for hours about all of these because we love these topics. So I'm, I'm wondering for the sake of our listeners, should we do like a, a rapid round through them all or do you want to pick a couple that we'll just say, make sure to stay tuned for this? What, what's your pick? Yeah, I mean, look, I think maybe we each pick a couple that we think we're really all there and I'll go slow, I'll go quickly through them. But I think, why don't you keep going and talk about housing a little bit because I think this one's yeah. really important. So, and different for financial security as a focus. Yeah, I mean, the housing issues as they appear in COVID are, are really important. I mean, partly because the, the part of the issue is keeping people in shelter, right? And keeping people in stable, affordable, safe shelter, which we're not seeing around the country because of affordable housing issues leading up to COVID. So this discussion will not just be a traditional kind of what do we think about affordable housing? How does that impact a family's finance? But this is a tricky issue right now about both how do you keep folks in their homes through protecting via evictions or some other kinds of subsidy for paying rent. Also landlords need income from rent payments to keep those structures safe and sound for those families living in them. So there's a lot of um, important debate happening in this issue about like in the triage, it's just like families need to be in their home, but then in the recovery and stabilize, what is the real policy here that keeps households safe and does the long-term system work you and I were talking about in both the private and public sector? Um, oh gosh, cash infusions, I literally could talk all day about, but let me let, me let you talk about that one. That's fine, yeah, and I'll mention with housing, uh, we already uh, were in the middle of a, our epic cycle on housing. We're working on the standards framework. Uh, just a spoiler alert that, you know, there's so much opportunity as we look out beyond triage in the terms of housing supply and yeah. the post-COVID world and what's going on again well with asset prices that I think that there's a lot of potential innovation in that space. So uh, that's going to be a great one. I think, you know, in terms of the cash piece, we'll just, I don't think we need to say a lot right now about this. This is on everybody's minds, uh, not just the um, stimulus, but ongoing, what is the role of cash in people's lives? What is the need for it? What are the delivery channels? Um, how does it get delivered? We have three incredible papers coming out, a whole series coming out that are timed with this uh, right. main event. And so yeah. uh, we, we'll be hitting that from many more dimensions than people who are just tuned into the UBI conversation or to, uh, you know, like thinking about the safety net um, have, have been thinking of in the past. So I think that's important. Um, I think moving into the um, uh, this whole issue of debt and the hangover of debt that we're going to be leaving um, a COVID-19 world with. Uh, not just at the national level, but at the household level. That's We've got a couple of really heavy hitting seminars or, and series going on around that. Student loan is one of the most interesting opportunities for how we can help households. Um, the people who actually hold debt uh, are quite surprising. Well, think, especially your point about, you know, some of the proposals around student loan debt that are getting more traction now than they did before because of COVID really are around some of the racial inequities around that debt. So that that is gonna be, I think, one, one not just to watch, because we're trying to get everyone to act, one to watch, one to listen, one to figure out what's my role in. That's right. 
Um, so that one's going to be incredible. And then I think, you know, we've learned so much about the uh, what, where are the places where debt's going to be con continuing to accrue and how does debt actually get uh, resolved and forgiven and and um, managed uh, in people's lives. And this is not just credit card debt. It's not just auto debt. It's fines and fees and unpaid bills and all the things that go into collections. It end up in it's a legal issue. You're right. It's a systems issue. It's it's a really interesting, wonky but important mashup of kind of the people who care about family finance, the people who understand the court system. This one is going to impact such a big part of America. That debt hangover, you know, line exactly. So that's an important one too. I think you know just to quickly go through. Obviously, um, we've got another really exciting uh, paper to be released that was already in process, but we're scrambling to rethink it a little bit in terms of the framing here. But you know, dependent care, the costs uh, of dealing with um, of dependent care, and the need for solutions like say, paid leave and a livable wage are all going to be part of a, another really important piece of the series. Um, and, and then I think we really are hopeful that come June, we'll be able to start turning to um, some of the work that a lot of our colleagues are working deeply on right now and that we have always been steeped in, which is like, how do we actually rebuild savings in America at, for that buffer zone as a complement to a strengthened and modernized safety net? Uh, I think if, for anybody reading a lot about post-pandemic research, there's not a lot of it out there, but the San Francisco Fed just came out last week. You know, precautionary savings is something that always in increases after a pandemic, after a war, after a, ca a catastrophe. Earn is seeing this. Earn is one of our Consumer Insights Collaborative Partners. They're seeing this in their data already uh, yeah. with, their, um, with their folks. And then we're going to turn to longer-term financial security. We know that one of the features of uh, the CARES Act was that people could draw down retirement savings um, without a lot of the particular penalties. Um, yeah. There's lots of reasons to think about that or not. There's also a lot of people that don't have that option. What does it actually take to create a holistic savings system, an inclusive savings system in this country that connects with a deeper understanding of people's financial lives? So I, I just want to echo, Joe, back to you and like maybe let you close it out here that sure. these are areas we picked because we know we have not just deep knowledge ourselves, but deep networks. And so what we're gonna be holding up here, ideally, is some of the most innovative leaders uh, who are taking action, some of the um, best evidence about why these issues are solvable. They were yeah. solvable before COVID and they must be solvable now. And, uh, and we think we've got the best network uh, anywhere uh, of people across uh, industry and uh, across government, uh, a real cross-sector stakeholder network that can help to solve these problems. We're looking forward to, to working with you on that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And so for those of you that have signed up and know this and signed up and don't know it, but you, you sign up for each one of these, um, after it, just like after today, you're going to get an email in your inbox 24 hours later, thanks to Megan, that will say kind of here's the state of play on that issue. Here are a handful of solutions that private sector leaders, public sector leaders, philanthropy, kind of whoever the right set is for that issue can, can do something about now. And here's a link to really quality, credible resources, you know, some of which will be ours, but most of which will be our amazing colleagues and peers out in the world right now. Um, so we're following up. You'll be able to ask us questions on that landing page for the series. You'll be able to ask us questions via social. This is not meant to be Ida and I, I mean, with all jokes aside about my podcast about unsolicited opinions, which will come out. Um, this isn't actually about us deciding what's right or wrong. It's about us finding a lot of hope optimism, confidence, actually, in people be rising to the challenge, showing their best selves, and getting important solutions into the world. And so we're bringing those folks together to give you what you need to do that. So please come to all of them. Please share this information. If we're missing one or two that you're like, how could they possibly solve this problem without this issue? let us know you know we are we are in virtual world we can add these things left and right i mean with all seriousness like we can and there's already uh, two we're thinking of there right joe i mean there's there's obviously a critical one we've been doing a series of kind of health and wealth conversations so we're excited about adding to that and of course 
all of the implications about the future of the labor market. Our colleagues at the Economic Opportunities Program and other places, when, when we did the work and wealth series with them, was important. So I think that this really connects with the future of work conversation as well. So we Great. will look to hopefully pull in other colleagues at Aspen as well to help help build this out uh, in response to what we're hearing from all of you. Yeah, and what you guys need to know to act, and that that's our clear, transparent, you probably want me to stop saying it. You're going to be relieved I'm not on the next ones because I won't keep saying it. Uh, but the challenge to you all, and this is really Aspen, I'll end it with Aspen's founding around, you know, just post-World War II, which is this world did something we didn't think it could. Um, we can't let that happen again. And how are we going to bring our best selves to the table as government, as business, as practitioners, as philanthropists, um, as citizen leaders? To, to make this world the world we wanna see. And so that's why the series is on. Families are struggling, but I have enormous faith and confidence in all of you that have been sitting here on this conversation with us and in our networks and in our own team and in my colleagues at Aspen that we, we will build a better world and we will do it together. And we will start with the safety net on April 29th. And we will see you all back then for that uh, series episode. So thank you.